In the second half of the 1800s, there was something called the War of the Romantics. Nobody died, as far as I know, but it was a conflict between two opposing philosophies of music. On one side was the New German School, led by Liszt and Wagner. Liszt said, new wine required new bottles, meaning that the old forms of music were obsolete and that he was creating new ones. Similarly, Wagner believed that the future of music lied in opera, and that pure music, that is, music for music's sake, no storyline, no imagery, just pure music, had basically finished with Beethoven. Beethoven's ninth had been the end of the symphony, and it was futile to bother writing a new one. From now on, the future of music lay in opera, or in programmatic music, that is, music connected with imagery or a storyline. The new school, then, believed themselves to be surely the successors of Beethoven. Wagner was kind of right about the symphony. Since 1850, there were basically no symphonies of note being written. They had fallen out of fashion. On the other side of this war were the Conservatives. This battle was led by Mendelssohn, Schumann, and later on Brahms. Kind of strange to see Schumann there, who I always think of as pretty progressive. But these folks believed in the ideals of pure, absolute music. The kind that the New School said was over. They valued the past, the traditional forms, the older ways of doing things, and they wanted to uphold this lineage. The old school, then, also believed themselves to be surely the successors of Beethoven. This conflict endured because there was this feeling that the true path of the future of music was either one or the other. It couldn't be both. On top of this, concert culture was developing in Europe. Audiences became much larger and socially diverse. New concert halls were built to accommodate them. Think of the Vienna Musikverein, the Leipzig Gewandhaus, the St. James's Hall, the Royal Albert Hall, Carnegie Hall, the Boston Symphony Hall, all built for new symphony audiences in the later 1800s. So, in order to draw audiences in, the concert seasons would promise a set of established masterpieces. Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, and so on. And this might be where the classical canon was established. It's sort of where the word classical music comes from, the idea that there is an established repertoire of classics. So anyway, the stage is set. A not-so-bloody conflict rages on between the new school and the old school. Enter Brahms, a protégé of Schumann's. Schumann had this great belief that Brahms was the chosen one, that he would prove the ideals of conservatism in a new age. Schumann actually published an article about Brahms, saying, It has seemed to me that there would and must suddenly appear some day one man who would be singled out to make articulate in an ideal way the highest expression of our time. One man who would bring us mastery, not as the result of gradual development, but as Minerva springing fully armed from the head of Cronus. And he is come, a young creature over whose cradle graces and heroes stood guard. His name is Johannes Brahms, and he comes from Hamburg, where he has been working in silent obscurity, trained in the most difficult theses of his art by an excellent teacher who sends me enthusiastic reports of him, recommended to me recently by a well-known and respected master. That master was the famous violinist Josef Joachim. So here's the problem. Brahms felt that he had to fit in with this historic culture of classical music. He felt that he had to write music that would have a place with these timeless and enduring masterpieces. With this rising concert culture, there was a mounting pressure to place yourself in this lineage of classics. He was on the side of the old school, believing in the value of traditional forms. But how do you possibly add to that legacy, stand next to these established giants? Well, perhaps by assimilating the techniques and styles of the past, connecting yourself to that legacy, whilst continuing to write modern music. 
conforming to those traditional values and yet at the same time writing music that is fresh and original. So Brahms had an early fascination with techniques of ancient music. He spent a long time studying early music, particularly the works of J.S. Bach, Schutz and other early German composers. For him, I think, these composers had a sort of ancient aura of wisdom, and so he wanted to assimilate these early techniques and implement them in a modern style. This would prove that his music was fresh, new and expressive, and yet intimately connected with the great old masters. At the age of 23, he produced a wonderful early example of this, one of his most beautiful short choral works, the Geistliches Lied, or Sacred Song. If you were to listen to it now, you'd notice how beautiful it is, how consoling, comforting the music is, and how powerfully expressive the Amen is at the end. But when you look a little closer, you realise that the entire thing is a double canon, right the way through, for five minutes straight. The tenor part imitates the soprano after four beats at the interval of a ninth, and the bass does the same with the alto on a different melody. Meanwhile, the organ interludes have their own kind of canons at the ninth. You'd think this would sound like an academic exercise, yet the piece is so incredibly beautiful, and it's a staple of traditional choral music. To be able to achieve that blend of academic rigour and expressive beauty at the age of 23 is surely a sign of what is to come. It was actually around this time, aged 23, that Brahms began to sketch ideas for a first symphony. Schumann had encouraged Brahms to write this symphony. He said, if he will wave his magic wand, there lies before us still more wondrous glimpses into the secrets of the spirit world. Perhaps then, a new symphony would prove once and for all that there was still vitality left in those old forms. But it wasn't so simple. Brahms felt the weight of his task, trying to write something that could have a place in the classical legacy. He wrote, You have no idea how it feels to one of us when he continually hears behind him such a giant. Finally, in 1862, six years later, he had finished the first movement and played it to his friends. Clara Schumann, Robert's wife, wrote to Joachim saying, Everything is so interestingly interwoven, yet as spirited as the first outburst. One is thrilled by it to the full, without being reminded of the craft. So there was great craft in this movement, and yet it all served to be this thrilling, expressive piece of music. However, it took Brahms another 14 years to finish this symphony. At last, it was finished in 1876, when Brahms was 43 years old. For 20 years, this great task seems to have weighed him down. It was finished shortly after Wagner finished his Ring Cycle. This sense of competition, for who carries the true legacy of music, might have motivated Brahms to finish. We can now see how Brahms' first symphony continues the great symphonic legacy. It has an almost Beethovenian journey, from the struggle of the first movement through to the victory of joy and triumph in the finale, just like Beethoven's fifth or ninth. In fact, the finale has a distinctive hymn to joy, just like Beethoven's ninth, only this one is purely orchestral. This led the famous critic Hans von Bülow to call it Beethoven's tenth, a compliment, not an insult. It's funny because von Bülow used to be on the side of the new German school until Wagner ran off with his wife. <laughs> then he became a Brahms supporter. Hmm. Anyway, Brahms' first was proof that there was still life in the symphony, that the traditional forms could be renewed and refreshed. And once the burden of writing his first symphony was lifted, it was like the floodgates were opened. Brahms completed three more symphonies in about a decade. Most importantly, Brahms' music wasn't just backwards looking. He brought something new to the table. His symphonies, like most of his music, were ultra motivic. The entire fabric of his music is a great tapestry, weaved of these tiny fragments of motifs. 
Instead of the traditional thematic symphony of Beethoven and Haydn, Brahms would create these enormous musical designs out of the smallest particles of ideas. For example, this is how the symphony starts. Notice the annotations. Then the exposition will start with this idea. Then the exposition ends with this idea. It's all subtle, you might not even notice it, but it's all unmistakably there by design. For another example, the finale begins like this. And that later transforms into the hymn of celebration. These are just quick examples, but you could probably write a whole book on the motivic connections in Brahms' symphonies, seriously. It's like an intricate tapestry of interweaved motifs, which you might not even notice as you listen, but this weave comes together to produce a work of art of massive expressive proportions. So, it's common to think of Brahms as musically conservative, while Wagner was trailblazing into the future in a pathway that would eventually lead to Schoenberg. But this isn't so. Schoenberg himself wrote an essay titled Brahms the Progressive, showing how all this interweaving of small motifs was, in fact, progressive, how it became one of Schoenberg's principal techniques of composing, and he was a decidedly modern composer. It's funny that this War of the Romantics should have produced two of the greatest composers of their time, each one being a major influence on the future of music, and each one having intensely expressive music. Yet both, at least from their perspective, were on opposite sides of the field. If you want to discover 14 masterpieces of classical music and learn how to get the most out of classical listening, how to really feel what the music's expressing and understand what it's doing on an instinctive level, then check out my free course, 14 Pieces. It's absolutely free, so if you're interested, then follow the link below. If you'd like to support this channel or buy me a coffee to say thank you, you can visit my Patreon page. Thanks very much for watching.